Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference in the honor of Samson. I mean, it's a huge honor to, to be here, to see, to have been listening all these talks and have been heard, uh, well, I mean, everything that we like and love about Samson. And I had the chance to be working with Samson. It has been mentioned previously by Ruben and as well, but, and, you know, every time I've met Samson, I've learned something. I mean, I've learned something on about physics, about mathematics, about history, about life in general. And uh, so it was difficult for me to, to choose uh, uh, some memorial memory uh, because, you know, I mean, everything that I've got from Samson is so strong and so... And but I was so pleased that during one of the talk, he referred to, to one of the paper we wrote together. And that shows how much, I mean, he believes in what he does. And he thinks that really, uh, you know, every paper is going to be a contribution, important contribution. So first I would like to thank you for everything I got from you. So unfortunately today, I could not give a talk that is related to the work we did. <coughs> but I will give something that hopefully you will find interesting about uh, a work that it's ongoing from, uh, for a few years now with Spencer Block that you see here, uh, Charles Doran, Matt Kerr and Andre Novoselsev about uh, understanding uh, Feynman integrals. And in particular, I want to make a few statements, actually there will be a theorem, uh, about Feynman integrals and mirror symmetry and the, how, how this goes together with the idea that Feynman integrals are period integrals. <coughs> so as a physicist, my motivation comes from, <coughs> from this. So motivation comes from particle physics. So this is the X bump, you know, this is data that you of that you get from LHC, this is gravitational waves, and, and two colliding black holes, and they give you, I mean, they, they produce the gravitational waves, and you want to compute the, the signal, and then this is some solid state physics quantities. So all these three phenomena can be obtained by computing scattering amplitude. So the scattering amplitude are uh, quantities that tells you about, I mean, how these objects interact between themselves according to the rules of quantum field theory that is, uh, you know, beyond the physics that you have. However, it's particle physics, here it's gravitational physics, and here it's uh, as well some kind of particle physics but at lower energy. So, the problem is that <coughs> these integrals are very, very complicated objects. And one way that uh, <coughs> people do it uh, in quantum field theory, in particular the people who have developed a lot of these techniques for the Higgs physics, is to say that this function of vari uh, many variables, like the energy of the incoming and outgoing particles, the masses and things like that, can be expanded on some, as a sum, a finite sum of what we call master integrals. So you have your physical object here. Here you have some intermediate integrals that you, you call uh, master integrals. Here are some coefficients. And here is some rational function of the physical parameters. And the point is that uh, they should exist at every order in perturbation, a finite basis of integral. And depending if you want to look at X physics, electromagnetism like QED, or gravitational physics, then the only thing you have to change is the coefficient. So in a sense, I mean, once you know master integrals, then essentially <coughs> making a difference between uh, the various picture that you have here is essentially uh, changing the rational coefficient that is here. So I am insisting on this fact because these objects, the, 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 the scattering amplitude, are very, very complicated functions with branch cut, 
multi-valued, when you change the energy in the complex plane. So they are very highly transcendental functions. So all the, 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 the huge complications go there. So in a sense, if you have a way to, to, to give, I mean, a good basis, I mean, to understand the dimension of this basis and compute all these integrals, then you are done. So coefficients are complex, uh, rational functions or something? Complex, yes, complex, yes, yes, everything is complex. <coughs> so, so in a sense, I mean, there are many ways to present Feynman integrals, but uh, I mean, since uh, uh, it's a very huge, I mean, it's a, it, it's, it's a huge subject that has been studied for many years. So my starting point is what we call the parametric representation. So a uh, Feynman integral of at a given loop order, so the loop order tells you, I mean, the, about the um, uh, expansion in, in, in perturbation, this is the space-time dimension, and uh, is given by some integral over projective space of some rational, some ratio of, so it's, here it's a polynomial that I'm going to write to you. I mean, actually, I will study, the, the, main of the, the point of the talk is to study that polynomial in detail, to some power omega. So omega is the sum of some integers, L is an integer, D is an integer divided by two, so this thing is, can be an integer or an half integer. And u is another polynomial that I will describe in a minute. So then you have here, you have to integrate over uh, the positive quadrant, an object that is, okay, when, when omega is an integer and d, d over two is an integer, so this is a rational function. And you want to understand what is the property of this integral in terms of the coefficient of these polynomials. So the point is that, as was I mean, uh, understood uh, many years ago, and is that this is some kind of period integrals, in the sense of what you know, period of elliptic curves and things like that. So uh, this is what I want to explain to you. So this, is, this is real projective space. Excuse me, this is projective space. This is a projective space, yes. Real. Uh, the x is in a real projective space. But these this, this parameters are complex. Right? So S is an M. So they, they are the coefficient of the polynomials here, okay? But the X is a real projective space, right? Is it clear? Okay. So this integral actually can, be, can have poles and can be divergent. So what we do is that in this representation, you treat, you do dimension regularization. So you do a Laurent expansion with respect to the pole. So when you have a pole, then at, at uh, so that means you have a D minus, for example, four, square, and then there's a coefficient, and then etc., and then you do Laurent expansion. So in the rest of the, of the talk, I will always assume that my integral is, is finite, so I, I don't have to worry about the pole. But I mean, in a sense, I mean, everything I'm saying applies to the, the coefficient of the Laurent expansion around the critical dimension when you do dimension regularization. So what are my polynomials? So this polynomial is the second Zimanzig polynomial. It has a form like that. So the mass of the internal particle that participate to your quantum field theory uh, process appear linearly in terms of x. So this is some 1 to m, m i square x i. Here there's a u polynomial that is homogeneous of degree l plus u is homogeneous of degree l. It is composed by the product of the projective variable x i and the coefficients are 0 and 1. So there is no no physical coefficient. So there is no mass, no kinematical parameter. And the V polynomial is an homogeneous polynomial of degree L plus one, the product of the X size, the projective coordinate, and the S size J are the quadratic, the, the scalar product between the external momenta. Okay? So the thing is that this guy is homogeneous degree L plus one in projective space Pn minus one. So L is the loop order. <coughs> N is the number of edge of your graph. And because, I mean, it's a planar graph, then you know that the num uh, it has to satisfy a relation that there is the number of vertices is one plus the number of edges minus L. So that means I have a degree, I have the number of variables. From this, I can deduce that the graph has uh, the number of vertices of the graph. Sometimes they are divergent, this integral. So where yes. is the regularization? The regularization is here. This is what I said. I mean, you do DIMREG, you do an expansion in terms, you, you extract the poles. And what I'm saying is that the residue of each of the poles, uh, uh, it's a plan. It's a residue. I mean, it, it, there are always residues. I mean, the point is that this, so the thing is that if this is finite, okay, 
Actually, you can see as well this integral as a residue integral on the locus where f vanishes, but anyway. But, but when the integral uh, diverges when, for example, d equal 4, so you do an expansion uh, in, in 4 minus 2 epsilon, right? And the question of the 1 over <coughs> epsilon poles are the regularized uh, object, and this is that applies to what I said. I mean, so there's no change. Just one more question. So this is actually you rewrite as the Feynman parameter? Yes, this is the Feynman parameterization. This is Feynman. Yes, this is the Feynman parameters. So the thing is that, as, I so as usual, Samson went a little further. So in a sense, I mean, uh, indeed, this integral are residue, point carré residues. So there are the point carré, you can see that there are the point carré residues in the form of uh, along the locus where uh, this, uh, this polynomial vanishes. So the problem with this integral is that this, uh, the, this object, f equals zero, is an hypersurface in projective space, and it has a lot of singularities and non-isolated singularities. <coughs> so you are, you, it's very difficult to get a smooth geometry, and this is, that makes the algebraic geometry very difficult. The other problem is that, as well, the, the, this uh, second semantic vanishes on the boundary of the domain of integration. So that means, you know, the, you, I'm integrating on the, uh, on the positive quadrant, so 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. They are all sitting, they are all on, the, on, on, on F, so F vanishes on the boundary. So that means if I you want to see that as a period integral, you can't because this is not a this is not a proper cycle. I mean because there's a boundary, right? Because of this. So you, what you have to do is that, for example, in a case that I will describe, when the, the second semantic defines some kind of elliptic curve, the domain integration, for example, is p3, so the, uh, p2, so projective space in three variables. Your 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 integral. I mean the the, the f polynomial vanishes at the at the corner of your domain integration, then you have to do some blow-up, like that. So that, then, you, you avoid this point. <coughs> so this means, in general, the claim is that all these Feynman integrals are period of a motif, I mean, or a Hodge structure, where what you do is that you have, you look at the relative period. The relative period is to take into account this, uh, I mean, boundary issue once you have done the proper blow-up. So that means you, you, you want to understand what is the cohomology of that, uh, the middle cohomology of that uh, object. And the reason why you want to do that is that once you understand the middle cohomology of that, you know that there is a, an operator that is called the Picard-Fuchs operator. The Picard-Fuchs operator is a differential operator that acts on the physical parameter that if this is a period, in, if this is a pure period, the Picard-Fuchs operator will kill the integral, but because of this relative thing, there's always an inhomogeneous term. So the thing is that uh, it's very difficult to get this picard fuchs operator. If you just look at the integral and try to do it, okay, so how do I, uh, how do I compute it? It's a very complicated question in math and physics. In physics, there are many ways one can try to do it by using integration by part identity and things like that. But what I want to explain to you is that once you understand the, the geometry of this Hodge structure, this thing comes easy. I mean, both. The source term is a distribution? No, the source term is not a distribution. The source term is a, is a graph with the reduced topology when you have colla uh, collapsed an edge. So in a sense, it's an over Feynman graph with one less edge. It's a boundary term. So it's not a distribution. So in a sense, I mean, this, this question of understanding what are these quantum field theory Feynman well, I mean, you can, you can put in physics, in parallel, what you, what you want to do in math. I mean, in a sense, you want to compute the period. I want, as a physicist, compute this period integral explicitly, get numbers out of it. I want to understand the, 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 the monodromy of this, which is the same as understanding the unitarity of the S matrix. I want to construct the system of differential operator, the picard fuchs operator, which is, as I, I said, is related to what the people in QCD uh, are doing by this integration by part method. And uh, I want to understand what class of function. What are these integrals? Elliptic function, elliptic polylogs, automorphic forms. I mean, this, actually, this is in, in the case that I'm studying. I mean, uh, you see everything. I mean, uh, so far. And maybe you can be pessimistic and say you are going to cover. There is no genericity. At some point, you will exhaust this class of special function. But who knows? So one very special case that I want. Um, one, one, one interesting point of view is to look at this polynomial. 
So this polynomial, you see, it's a projective, it's homogeneous degree L plus 1 polynomial in projective space. Okay? And the, same, and the same for you. So you have two homogeneous polynomials in projective space, yeah? And you want to compute an integral of that. So in this, this is typically uh, a GKZ type of integral, so gelfand zelevinsky kapranov approach, where you look at a, an integral of some appropriate cycle of some product of polynomial in projective space, right? So this is a multi-index notation, so that tells you uh, what are the indices of the monomials in, in some uh, finite subset of uh, Zn, of the, of the lattice. So GZK tells you that if you have this from the data just of the, of the exponent in the monomial, you can build naturally a set of differential operators. So there's one differential operator that is linear in terms of the, uh, the, the coefficient that appear in the polynomials. In particular, there is the Euler operator that tells you about the, the weight integral scales and the you know, rescaling. And then there is a differential operator that is uh, of higher order and that uh, acts on the integral. So the point is that GZK tells you that there is a set of differential operators that kill some, some version of my integrals with an appropriate cycle. So there is a zero here. So, and GZK even tell you that... Uh, sorry, but uh, anyway, you have to solve the last system, right? Yes. Uh, there, there's an hypergeometric function. Yeah. <laughs> so GZK tell you that actually uh, 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 a solution is the famous hypergeometric series. Okay? So then you look very happy because then there's some kind of genericity you want. So, for example, one particular case, uh, 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 I, mean, I want to tell you. What is the C in the previous equation, the inner C? Uh, C is a shift that you can, uh, it's defined from, uh, okay. So the point is that in the data here, you, you take, a, uh, it's, a, it's a complex parameter. It's a, it's a shift that you can have. So it becomes inhomogeneous. Uh, no, no, it's not inhomogeneous, it's homogeneous. I mean, well, it depends the way you want to write it, okay? So, well, yeah, okay, well, what I'm saying inhomogeneous means that there is another function that appears here. Yeah. So this is the same. You can see that as a... Yes, yeah, a differential operator. It's like the Euler operator. Like, for example, C would be the degree, for example, okay? So the integral I wanted to, to, I want to study is this integral, omega, this residue form, integrated over the positive quadrant. So what happens is that if you change the domain of integration, you take the same integral, your Feynman integral, but integrate it over a torus, Okay, then it's, 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 uh, you can apply GZK. It's a period integral. It's going to be killed by your picard fuchs operator. And this has been used by physicists uh, to, uh, to try to derive the differential operator. But you know that because you, you look at uh, this special integral, which is a period integral, correspond to what we call the maximal cut, where you cut all the propagators, and then it's easier to try to, to, to obtain the differential operator. It's a complex story, yes. Yeah, yes. So, so the thing is that, theoretically, the, 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 the polynomial you get there has all these coefficients. So the thing is that, the thing that is very annoying, but it makes actually uh, the story interesting, is that the, the, if you write the, the, the generic toric polynomial that satisfies the criteria I want, which is the number of variables and the degree of the, po uh, of the homogeneous degree, you get many, many coefficients here. And in fact, the, 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 the Feynman integral are specific restrictions. So they are non-generic uh, uh, polynomials. So you have to have, you have to map this Fa, this coefficient, to the smaller set of kinematical variable internal masses. And the relations are purely linear. But the thing is that typically, you would have much more parameters if you apply the GZK formalis than you need in a, in, in a physical sense. So in technical terms, that means that once you have obtained the set of differential equations that GZK tells you, you have to restrict your system of differential equations to the physical locus where the, um, the, the Feynman integral lives. Uh, and so this is, this is one, one very, very difficult thing because technically you have to restrict what we call the, the D module. The other thing I, I, I mentioned is that for the, for the Feynman integral I'm interested in, I don't want homogeneous case. I mean, I want inhomogeneous differential equation. So you have to understand how to uh, extend the GZK formalism to relative periods and get inhomogeneous system of differential equation. 
So this is a problem that has been looked by Yao, and uh, recently Albrecht Klem has a paper on it. And, uh, but, but there is no, I mean, it, it's, it's very difficult. Okay. So let me tell you one way to, so you want to give a differential equation acting on a period that, is, that gives you this term. So suppose you can construct an operator that I will call, uh, yeah, I mean, so the, the operator T that kills the, the form you're integrating. So the operator is composed by what I call a telescoper and a certificate. So the thing is that here you want that this operator acts on the, on, on the parameter of your integral. So this is something that should not depend on the, on, on, on the variable of integration, no x is. And you want that actually the, the, the remaining path is a total derivative in the space of x's, okay? So typically, you get something like that. So, and, and the coefficients are polynomials in your parameter and the x's, and they are yeah, derivatives like that, okay? So if you do that, if you have such an operator, you integrate over a cycle, then, okay, then this one goes through <coughs> because it doesn't depend on the variable of integration, then you get here a total derivative, and if you have a something that is a pure cycle, then by integration by part, this has no boundary, and then you get bingo, it works. The, the differential operator kills the period, okay? And essentially, this is the idea that physicists are using when they use the maximal cut to try to understand this Picard-Fuchs uh, uh, Picard operator. In a case of uh, the Feynman integral, because of the boundary, what I said about the intersection between the domain of integration and the graph polynomial, I mean, gives you a homogeneous term that is obtained by graph where you go to slices. So luckily, there's a very, very efficient way to do that. That is uh, some adaptation of uh, the creative telescoping that was introduced by Zellerberg. And, and the advantage is that uh, this creative telescoping works in all cases. So for people who are, uh, I mean, have tried to practice this kind of method, the, and there is a Normally, you can try to use what's called Griffith's Dwork, which is a way to work in cohomology and do the pole reduction, you know, and using the, I mean, on the Jacobian. The problem is that because there are non-isolated singularities, Griffith's Dwork fails. Okay? So if you try to resolve the singularity, changing the polynomial, then the problem is that the, 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 the differential operator explodes and the, the complexity of the computation uh, explodes. But creative telescoping is a way to go around this. And the thing is that it gives you a way to get the minimal order differential operator. So, for example, one graph that I like very much is this uh, multi-loop sunset. So, so if there is only one loop, it's the one loop, and then there is yeah, it's a one, two, three loop sunset. So, or sunrise, the way you want to call it, it has one momentum coming, one and three uh, three massive particle. So, all these guys with n lines uh, defines a graph of where the loop order is n minus 1. The degree of the, of the second Zimanzik is degree n. So you have a degree, the f equals 0 defines a degree n. Uh, so uh, f equals 0. So f has degree n in, uh, in projective space that is pn minus 1. So I'm going to explain that f e the f equals 0 condition for the sunset graph defines always a Calabio n minus 2 fold. So that means two loop is an elliptic curve, three loop is a K3, etc. The thing that is more tricky um, is that suppose you look at this two loop graph, which is a, uh, called the kite. So the kite, you have one, two, three, four, five. So you are in P4. The degree is three because it's a two loop. Then you have a cubic in P4. So actually, the thing that is extremely interesting here is that the cubic in P4 has been studied. I mean, Griffiths, Clements, in particular. This, the singularities of the Feynman graph imply that actually this is an elliptic curve that controls that graph. So all the geometry is an elliptic curve here. Yeah. And if you just look at the case where you just have one incoming and one outgoing, so no external momenta here, it's even genius zero. So that tells you how you can get from a very complicated um, uh, uh, geometry, algebraic geometry, to the non-generic city of the Feynman integral can reduce the geometry because once you have the elliptic curve, then you win, because you know there is a canonical way to write the differential operator, and this is finished. Another two-loop graph, which is very complicated, is that, for example, this one has uh, your NP5. It's again a cubic in P5. It's a cubic fourfold. 
So what you want to study is the middle cohomology of this graph, and it's, a, it's like a K3. So naively, you think, I mean, you would think it's a K3. So the Hodge numbers would be 0, 1, 21, 1, 0. But the point is that there are a lot of singularities. <laughs> and so the thing is that computing the transcendental lattice, I mean, is, is non-trivial. And actually, what kind of K3 is that? And if you find it's a K3 with PK number 19, then, then again, the, you, you have an elliptic curve that controls the, the cohomology. So this is the idea of the... Of the so, then, so that means we have a conjecture, which is called the motivic mirror conjecture, which is hard versions, so that every Feynman integral satisfies an irreducible Fuchsian, Fuchsian system over momentum space. So this is the Picard-Fuchs operator. Uh, so this Picard-Fuchs operator is actually obtained from a pencil of Calabio varieties. And, and the thing that is, that actually we are, I mean, writing the paper on that is that actually uh, we can interpret this thing in terms of mirror symmetry between, between landau ginzburg model, different from the, from the second Zimondi graph polynomial, and some weak Fano varieties, where the mass parameters are exactly the Keller, the Keller parameter. So it's a dimension of the Calavio. Two dimensions? I will, I will show you. It depends on the loop order. It depends on the loop order, OK? But the thing that is extremely important is that this is why I don't like massless, massless graph. I mean, massi massive graphs, the mass parameter of the graphs are the killer parameters that you need. So in a sense, it's much easier for me to, to, to look at massive graphs rather than massless graphs. So this is the, sun the uh, sunset family. So the sunset multi-loop, the graph polynomial is this homogeneous polynomial, and the Feynman integral is this in two dimensions. OK. So what, what already happened is that if you look at the case where all the mass, internal masses are one, but the p-square is the only kinematical variable, what happens is that this, this integral that normally is not a period because the domain of integration is unbounded, it has a boundary, turns to be, for special value of p-square, equivalent to a pure period. So that means this Feynman integral for a specific value of p-square, one and some other value I will give, this integral is given by some value of L functions. So for n equal 3, then you have an elliptic, you ha you have an elliptic curve. When p square equal 1, the value of the integral is zeta 2. For n equal 4, you have a k3, and we show that this k3 has a pika rank 19. And the value of the Feynman integral is given by the, by the L function of a k3 that is obtained from the middle cohomology that is here. And, and, and the modular form that you need here is this nice product of theta function, and there is a theta function here. For L equal 5, then you get a rigid freefall bar <laughs> nieto. So that answers the dimension of the Calabio. So, and then the value at 1 of this integral is zeta 2 times the L function uh, of f, a modular form, that is the square. You see, eta 2, 2, 2. This is exactly the same part as, I mean, the, no, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is all the divisors of 6 because it's related to the, to, the, to the elliptic curve that comes into the sunset case, the two-loop sunset, anyway. So, and so this, is, this is one of the things. And recently, there is a paper by Candelas, De La Rosa, Elmi, and Van Straden, who show that actually the attractor equation for n equal to supergravity, I mean, leads to a one-parameter Calabio freefold, which equation is defined like that, which is exactly phi is 1 over p square, And for value of phi that is, Minus uh, s um, uh, seven, or oh, okay, p square is well, yes, I think it's five minus minus seven. For example, this is again rigid. So there are many, there are, there are va various values of phi where you get a rigid Calabio, and in particular in context of this attractor mechanism, I mean this, this is this is this is this is. Sorry, Pierre, ju just regarding previous uh, uh, short comment. Uh, in principle, uh, how far can you get? Because uh, CY3 is giving you uh, elliptic MPL, right? Yes. You cannot take this into place. But actually, can you, can you compute the trip? What does this L, L series uh, provide you? So, what does this L series provide you? Okay, so, so first, I mean, the value at 1. I mean, uh, so, I, 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 so the point is that it depends what you want to. I mean, I think it's interesting to, to, to see the relation between them, right? So, because then you, you understand it's a pure period, it's the lean conjecture, right? So, I mean, it's more mathematical curiosity, I would say. In terms of so, so, for the case of this uh, sunset graph, actually, you, what you can show is that actually they all define, the, the f equals 0 defines a smooth Calabio um, n minus 2 fold. 
So you just do, you look at the, 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 the polytop, you do, I mean, uh, resolution, whatever. So, for example, ah, okay, this picture doesn't go very well. So that was the picture I had, you do the blow up. So this is, for example, for the two-loop sunset, the cubic, it's a cubic in P2. And then you realize that toically, I mean, actually, this is, this is DP6. So P2 blown at three points, I mean, the three point that is here. So this is the case I studied a long time ago with Spencer block. But in general, I mean, for all, for all this family, I mean, you find that actually it's NEF, and, and so they all smooth Calabio to a loop order. So what you do with that? So what you do is that actually, um, because you know it's a Calabio n minus twofold, then you know, I mean, you can compute the cohomology, the Hodge numbers, you can compute the picard fuchs operator, so I'm going to show you some of them, and then you discover something very interesting which is so far specific to this family of sunset integrals, but, but it's a very important fact. So I told you that the, 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 the graph polynomial of a Feynman integral is a non-generic restriction of a toric polynomial. But it turns that for the sunset graph, there are generic complete intersections. Because there are generic complete intersections, then essentially this is the way you can completely understand them. From the complete intersection, you understand that actually you can go from the the equation with n to n plus 1 by changing the variables in this way. So, so you understand that actually the, 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 the Calabio at the L loop order is an elliptic vibration of the Calabio you got at L minus 1 loop order. So for example, at two loop you add, you add here uh, uh, an elliptic curve that is defined this way. And, so, and, and the Feynman integral is an elliptic d log and this is the motif associated to it. So at three loop, what you get is that you get a polytop from the graph polynomial. And the thing is that, and maybe the picture is not easy to do, so it turns that my, my, my kid had a toy. And this is, it turns this is exactly the polytop you need. Strange enough, I don't know why people do this sort of things for the kid, but you see, there is, there is an hexagon in the middle. So this is the slice that gives you the previous one. You can count the number <laughs> of faces and number of triangles. So what, what happened is that you see directly the elliptic vibration that this, this three-loop sunset is, you can see that an elliptic vibration on a two-loop sunset, and that allows you to understand totally the, um, the, the type of K3 you get uh, uh, from this. Because the generic toric polynomial at Picard, at Picard number 11, Picard rank 11, but the one you need for physics has Picard rank 16 at most, and then when you restrict the internal masses, then you see the Picard rank is changing, so that means this is the, ga the, the case where you can you, you get this uh, uh, middle cohomology, and then why the, the Feynman integral is given by an elliptic free log. But then in general you have a Picard rank 16 guy, where the I mean we know everything about the transcendental lattice, but everything is possible because you have this elliptic vibration. And just to show you, so once you know that, you can deduce what is the Picard Fuchs operator. It's an order six Picard Fuchs operator in terms of the external variable p square, and then you have coefficients that are polynomial with uh, singularities at the, what we call the physical threshold, but then there are apparent singularities. So the thing is that the, the, the difficulty in this differential operator is not really the, the, the order of the differential operator, it's more the degree of the polynomial, because here, this guy has degree 17. If you go to the next one, which is a Calabio threefold, Generically, if, if the masses are different, it has these Hodge numbers, it has 30 nodes. When all the masses are the same, is the case I mentioned in context of this um, uh, attractor thing. Uh, the, this is a rigid uh, Bart Nieto quintic. Then the, the, the differential operator goes from, in the rigid case, to order 4 to the generic 5-loop, uh, uh, no, 4-loop case to an order 12, and that you can easily understand once you understand uh, what I said. But the thing that is difficult to get, of course, is the, the coefficient of the polynomial in the differential operator. I know this guy has a degree 121. So when you generate this Picard Fuchs operator, you, you start spitting out all these polynomials that have huge, huge degree, and, uh, and, and, and this is, this is the, dif the, the real difficult part. But okay, it's a technical part, but at least it's a uh, in the usual approach to master integrals, people have a system of uh, first order. Uh, yes. So yes. 
here you reduce to one equation for one separate integral, would not it be simpler to have <coughs> a system with lower degrees and all? No, because the system is... Uh, so it depends what system you are talking about. I can write in terms of a first-order system and use what you call the Gauss-Manin connection, but then it's equivalent to writing this Picard-Fuchs operator. But the, one, the system that is generated from the IBPs is a first-order system with a flat connection, but you have to reduce it. I mean, you have to, 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 to reduce the, this matrix, and, and then it's not evident when you look at this that you really have what, what I said. So, for example, already on the sunset, to see that it's, uh, <coughs> there's an elliptic curve there, and then you have to, to look at the block structure, and then you recognize there's a 2 by 2 block in the 4 by 4 matrix, or 7 by 7, it depends on the way you write it. So, so it's, it, it's easier to, to zoom directly there in terms of efficiency. Well, from my perspective, okay, uh, other people like Pierre Paolo may have different point of view, but. Uh, but uh, so, one of the things I want to, 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 to finish with this talk is the following. So, I say that. Um, I mentioned in the beginning of the talk that I like the mass parameters because they are the Keller parameters of on the mirror side. So the thing is that let me let me take for example this case. This case defines an elliptic curve, right? So I have one, two, three mass parameters and a p square. Okay, if you want, I can rescale it. I like to write it this way because p square is the coordinate. That, I mean, it has to do with the coordinate, the center of the of this uh, the polytop, yeah, the, the the hexagon for the dp6. Uh, but you see, once you define, when you go to the form, when you write this thing in terms of an elliptic curve, and you write the complex structure of the elliptic curve and the Qs, you, you have lost track of what is m, the masses, right? Because, I mean, everything goes into the transformation of this uh, cubic in terms of a Weierstrass normal form, and then you, you, you deduce what is the, the, the period ratio. And in, in, so in the map, I mean, you, 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 you lose explicitly, you don't see explicitly the masses M1, M2, M3, right? Because the advantage is that there is another representation that we found um, with um, Spencer and Matt, we, where all these masses are explicitly displayed in the expression for the, uh, when you compute the Feynman integral, which exactly is what you do when you do the mirror map. So. The claim is that this uh, two-loop sunset Feynman integral is some period integral of the elliptic curve times a quantity, which is, um, people used to write it in terms of elliptic delog, right? But here I'm going to write it in a form that doesn't look like an elliptic delog, but has the very good uh, taste of having this, this thing that is the powers of Q, and Q is m squared, okay, and then there is this factor, exponential r0, which is actually uh, related to the period of the elliptic curve through this relation. This is the Mellor measure, if you want to, uh, the technical name. And then here, there are rational numbers. And these rational numbers, I mean, so we give it, I mean, we compute it. And then when you look at what are these rational numbers, you realize that these rational numbers are exactly local gram of written invariant. So they are alternating signs, and they are rational, and they grow like they should grow for gram of written. So the interpretation is very simple, and actually, is w what you can do is that you can take the sunset elliptic curve. You can do that for any loop order, but for the sunset elliptic curve, you take the sunset elliptic curve, you add two extra variables. What you do is that you then you build a non-compact Calabi of freefold, which is an Oriva model. In a previous talk, it was mentioned uh, in the context of the work that uh, Marcos Marino and collaborator did. I mean, a case where there's a similar construction where the the equation here was not exactly that one, because this one, you know, has cross term between x1 and x2. So if you take the equation that, is, um, that has no cross term between x1 and x2, then you get the, the, the p1 times p1 model. But here, it's, it's a more generic version. But then you, what you get is that you get here a non-compact uh, uh, Calabio freefold, from which you can compute the Yukawa coupling and things like that. And then what you realize, actually, is that actually this non local uh, this uh, local gram of return invariant are exactly the one associated with this uh, uh, Calabio freefold. So, I mean, as we explained in the paper, but I mean, you can see as well, so they, they, they satisfy, they are genus, they are <laughs> genus zero degree D uh, gram of return invariant. So this is what you have the famous formula, the divisor, one of the to the cube, and the little ends, okay? So, 
Then, then you come to, to a point and we say, okay, this is, this is Feynman integral, right? I mean, so how is it that you get genu zero uh, gram uh, return invariant just in computing a Feynman integral? I'm talking about a Feynman integral that is the two-loop sunset that comes into physical phenomena. I mean, QCD people use it, right? So, and, uh, so the thing is that wha what is the rationale behind that? So first, I mean, uh, you have to understand actually that um, um, I mean, th there, are, there are two aspects of that. So first, I mean, uh, what I like in that formula is that, in a sense, it tells you exactly what happens when you change the mass parameter. It's easier than, and the formula generalizes to it's to to any um, sunset order. So, so in a sense, it allows you to start answering the question: What is generic about fe sunset Feynman integrals? So at two loop, you have elliptic d log. Then at some point, you have elliptic free log. But then what? What are the function class of functions? So we are not asking this. I'm just uh, I'm, I'm just giving a formula in terms of uh, uh, gram of return invariant that tells you a way to telling that when n is different from three, what is the right hand side, and you can evaluate it. So this local gram of return invariant in general are difficult to construct because the next loop order I have to construct a non, uh, fourfold based on the k3. So one of the things we realized is that actually you can use, you can relate this local gram of return to a relative um, uh, gram of return invariant when you look at uh, the relative uh, number to the dp6, which is the base that I use for the sunset, and, and, and the divisor. And, and the advantage is that these numbers are much more easy to compute by localization. So this is, this is one thing. So because of the, so to any loop order, then you can apply localization technique to compute this uh, genu zero um, uh, number and then tell something about the, the Feynman integral. The other thing that I, you, you, I, I want to, to, to tell you is that, so <coughs> there is a notion in mathematics, I mean, about mirror symmetry between a Fano n fold, um, n, uh, n minus one fold, and a Landau Ginzburg model, okay? Uh, 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 and the thing goes like that. So the thing is that it tells you that the period, you, you have to equate two periods. So, uh, so the statement is that the gram of return theory of the Fano side should be related to the Hodge theory, which is the one I described, on, uh, of the, you know, on, the, on, on the other side, by equating the regularized quantum period to the classical period defined from the... Um, the, the superpotential, okay, so the, the, the second semantic. Okay. So this integral, where gamma is a cycle, is precisely what I call the maximal cut. So in a sense, I mean, if you, this is exactly the, the expression for the, what I call the maximal cut of the sunset integral. So now you see that actually the, the special property of my uh, sunset multi-loop integrals is in fact an incarnation of this uh, mirror symmetry between, between uh, Landau, Ginzburg, and Fano. So you take, you take for the, the landau ginzburg superpotential the graph polynomial, which has this form. It's homogeneous of degree n in Pn minus 1. And then you can compute the central charge by, it's easy, is this. And, and this is exactly the same statement as I told you that you can prove that actually all this uh, f equals 0 defines uh, Calabio n minus 2 fold. So then, then I can use the mirror symmetry to evaluate my Feynman integrals. So, and then, so the theorem is the pencil of the sunset Calabio n minus one fold, Landau Ginzburg model, to weak Fano. So, specifically, the, I mean, if you restrict to the all equal mass case, then what you have is that uh, the, the relation goes, I mean, is a very simple relation to the product of P1s. And in a sense, I mean, it kind of clarifies something about the nature of these Feynman integrals. And in a very surprising way, because it's, it's more, more rich than what we, 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 I mean, I was expecting at the beginning of trying to, to get a new approach to computing Feynman integrals. So, so the thing is that uh, you, can, you can ask if I can do other graphs. Yes, I can. So, so the sunset is this. So the sunset, you take a, you take a, a one-loop bubble, then you make a middle line. It's a two-loop, and then you, 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 you keep adding lines. Okay. So there's a natural structure, 
And I said in astral structure implied that there is a natural elliptic vibration between these guys and they're all calabios. Now you take a one loop graph, a triangle. So I didn't draw here the external legs because of over it, the, the, the picture will not look pretty. But then if I start renormalizing the edge, adding a bubble this way, then I'm getting an elliptic vibration. So all these guys are elliptically fibered on the top of each other. And then, the, the, for example, the, the motif is controlled by an elliptic curve here. Yeah? You can prove it. I mean, so then it's a K-free, etc. No, you start with a square. You put, you put a bubble here, yeah? and then multi-loop this way. And then what you find is that there is again an elliptic curve here. Yeah? It's, it's highly non-trivial because you see you have one, two, three, four, five. So, uh, so again, you are again looking at a cubic fourfold. So to, to, to see that it's an elliptic curve and not some K3, I mean, you need to really, really understand the singularity structure of the graph. But, but this, this, this has to happen in a sense, because you know Feynman graphs are simple. But once you tell this is an elliptic curve, this is an elliptic curve, this is, this is a K3, then I say the differential operator I mean, comes for free, I mean, because there's a generic way to write it. So essentially, this is what I wanted to, to explain to you, is that uh, essentially, I mean, although this motivic approach looks very, very complicated because of this all uh, difficult algebraic geometrical question, I mean, there is some value because at the end you gain on, 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 on computational capacity in terms of solving physic, physics problem. And most of the physics that we're interested in is essentially two loop. So it's already very good. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Um, the sunset graphs, yes. if I view them in X space, it's just the product of Bessel functions. Yes, in two dimensions. In two dimensions only. Because this the is. Product, I mean, it's a product of yeah, rate yeah. function in any dimension. Yes. Oh, it depends what you. Uh, understand. So here, this very beautiful story is about the Fourier transform okay. of a product okay. of Bessel. Okay, so no, but that's, that's an important. So, so what Thibault says is that you can write, okay, I'm going to write it. So this is um, 2 to the n minus 1 uh, x. Okay. So the thing is that if you write it this way, so there, there are a lot of things that is very interesting. Is that uh, first, I mean, you can try to look at what are the equivalent product of you have n plus one Bessel function. So i zero and k zero uh, uh, satisfy the same the same uh, uh, second order differential equation and i0 grows like exponential plus x at infinity and k0 is exponential minus x, right? And the other cool thing about that is that i0 of z is 1 over 2 pi i uh, t equal 1 exponential minus z t, t plus 1 over t dt over t and k0 of z is 1 to infinity z t t dt over t. So this is the same integral, you just change the boundary. So it's exactly the same story as what I said. So there, you see, there. Yeah, you see it there. And this is fitting on the nose on these exponential motifs that uh, uh, Fresan and Josson has been studying recently. So in a sense, I mean, this is, you have the classical period in the sense of classical period à la deux lignes or whatever, so uh, when, uh, like period of elliptic curves, and then you have this object that are non-classical period, that are exponential, the period of exponential motives. So the fact that actually uh, the, 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 some of the property I told you are related to actually Bessel moment. So all the, pro the kind of integrals that are Bessel product you can study. And the thing is that when you write it this way, there are a lot of interesting uh, uh, number theoretical statements you can make. But where is the algebraic geometry? Yes. So where is the elliptic curve there? So the thing is that, uh, and, and, and this is where Broderst is really not only a master, he's a god into that, 
he knows how to put all these integrals into some matrices and then recognize that actually it, it, um, it associated, I mean, with special, uh, special property when p squared takes very, very uh, rational values. So this is an approach. And it's, it, it, it's quite efficient because you, numerically you can compute very well. Getting the telescoper is easy because it's a one-dimensional integral. But, but you don't see the geometry there. So. I zero NP0 as a classical Bessel function. I, I zero NP0. Yeah, there are the two Bessel functions that are just um, uh, the one. So this one is log at z equals zero. This one is regular. Yes, the answer is yes. Sure, yes. That, yes. So the thing is that uh, what I want to say is that the uh, yeah okay. So so there is one version of the integral actually that exactly computes the uh, the i function for the, the you know the, that you need for the mirror symmetry. Yes. So is it a theorem? Uh, this second statement it is a new result that. Feynman integers compute the genus zero. Yes, it, 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 it will be a theorem when the paper will be hot. But it is a theorem, yes. It, in the sense of a proof. And we have everything under control. So we can even, as I said, we, we can use the Fenlong method to compute this uh, relative um, uh, gromov witten invariant and compute the i function and everything on the nose. I mean, everything fits. So we see it. For the other graph, there's another graph, or families of graph, where the, the theorem applies, but in general, we have certainly to look at multipotential Lando Ginsburg, but okay. So uh, are they going to divorce the question? So is there, is there a position space version of what you have told us now in momentum space? Is there a position space version of what I said? You know, I, I write the, all these diagrams in position space, and then I yeah. try to... So, so this thing comes from the, f uh, I mean, writing what is the Fourier transform of the propagator, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so so that we know. Uh, so, so you already said you don't see the structures in X space. But no, I don't see this, no, so, I mean... Uh, there should also be a class of functions in the end, I suppose, no, which you, I suppose, yes. you could ask an equivalent question in, in yeah. position. I could ask, but I mean, the point is that, uh, what, I, what I said is that, I mean, I, I want to use the geometrical structure, right? You want to see what changes when you specify parameter. So for example, it's important to see, if you look at this way, if all the masses are different, or all the masses are equal, mm -hmm. the integral looks the same, right? Although one is killed by a differential operator for the n, or if n, depending on if n is odd or even, when the mass are different, the order is uh, uh, 2n, for example. So, so the thing is that, there's this geometric transition. Actually, it's a really geometric transition when the mass are equ uh, getting equal. And that you don't see in this representation. But, uh, but I don't know. Maybe that's not interesting for you. Mm -hmm. More questions? Well, thanks again.